Guys, in the last video, we talked about detectors, and we said there's two major ones, conductivity and UV, and both of these are pretty much maintenance-free, meaning that you're not supposed to do anything to them at all, and other than just changing the tubing out in front sometimes, you're never really supposed to get inside of the box. If there is a problem with the detector, then that detector probably needs to be changed out with a brand new one, and that's going to land you a couple of thousand dollars at least in order to get a new detector on the instrument. Uh, we also talked about the difference between conductivity and UV. Uh, we said conductivity is really the universal detector, and this detector can measure pretty much any ion that comes through. And then the UV vis detector, that is typically for transition metals. And these are things like chromium especially, where we can get a colored solution from a transition metal, and that can be analyzed by UV. Think about if you've taken the spectroscopy class, you probably did a couple of UV vis labs, and those had colored solutions, and those were things like manganese and chromium and all of the other ones, and iron, um, nickel. All of those are colored solutions that can be picked up with a UV, and it can be picked up with a UV detector on an IC instrument. So a couple of things that we want to talk about when uh, we talk about a detector. Uh, first is limit of detection. This is what we would abbreviate as an LOD. And limit of detection is basically how low can you go, all right? So how low can we go in concentration? Can we go to part per million? Of course we can. Can we go to part per billion? Well, that's a different type of scenario. We might, we might not. That just really depends on the type of instrument and the top of the detector sensitivity that we have. So le limit of detection is LOD. And the way that we kind of figure out how low we can go is that we look at basically the baseline of the instrument detector. So the detector is always going to give us some type of noisy baseline signal, right? It's always going to go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So we have to make sure that the analyte that we pump through is going to stand out and above the crowd. And if it does, then we can kind of determine, well, does it stand out enough? Is it that special? Or will it just basically blend in with the baseline and not be seen or not be detected? So typically what we do is that we look at the baseline signal and we want the area of that particular peak for the anion that we're trying to measure to be three times higher at least. The area needs to go above that baseline by a factor of three. All right, so here's an example of what we're talking about. Uh, if you zoom in on your baseline, what you'll see is that this constant noise will go up and down, up and down, up and down as the instrument is running. Well, if you zoom out on this enough, what you're going to see is a flat baseline, but it actually isn't flat, folks. It really isn't. If you zoom in enough, you're going to see this constant up and down, what we call noise, that's happening from the baseline. And then all of a sudden, an ion comes out, bing, and then it comes back down, right? And we want to make sure that this height is going to stand out from the crowd, meaning the baseline down here at the bottom. So typically what we do is that we look at the height of this peak, and what we want is the height of that peak to be at least three times higher than the base peak down here at the bottom or the baseline down at the bottom. All right? So that's what we're referring to, and that's what we would call the limit of detection. So we would kind of draw this dotted line because that seems like where our baseline maximum is going to be. Nothing really over that amount, and if so, it's not going to be that much. And then whatever that height is from the bottom or the baseline, we want three times that height. And you can see here in this diagram, it is three times higher than the actual baseline here at the very bottom. So that's what we would call limit of detection. And that's how we would determine how low we can go with our instrument before we begin to get any problems at all right? Uh, here's an example of some chromatograms, right? These are things that we've talked about before, and what you're seeing is that the uh, sample has been injected, and this baseline is pretty flat as we go, and then we talked about this dip that's right here. This little dip is called the water dip, 
and that basically is symbolic of your sample getting injected. Your sample is now venturing out and it's getting into the conductivity detector and that conductivity detector measured that disturbance a little bit because that's almost like a water molecule that's sent through the column. It's disturbed the conductivity a little bit. It's made it plummet, go down because pure water will read close to zero and then it kind of goes back up to baseline because now it's just all mobile phase again. So this is what we would call the water dip. And that water dip shows me that a sample is getting ready to come out. If I don't see that water dip, then there could be a problem. Maybe my instrument is not injecting sample at all. So here we see our first component come off. And then here at WB, we see our second component come off. We can talk about height. So that's what the H is here, the height of A and the height of B. And we can bring in all of those old chromatography equations back into the picture. All the ones that we talked about before, like capacity factor and selectivity factor and the number of theoretical plates, the resolution, all of those can come back. So my advice to you is go back and review those. Make sure that you know how to work those equations because I'll give you the equations. You just got to know how to work them and how to make sense out of the numbers that they're telling you. The T0, this is the dead time here. So how long did it take from the time you hit start to the time you saw the water dip? Because the water dip is going to be the very first thing that makes it through. And that is not retained by the column at all. It just zips right through without a problem. So this is going to be my dead time. And then my time for the A peak to come off would be T sub A. And the time for my B peak to come off would be T sub B. And that's what you're seeing there. And then we can do an adjusted retention time. Meaning that I take the dead time that my water took to come off because it's got to travel through all that tubing and all of that tubing is going to take some time to go through, right? And then I can subtract the T sub A from it and that will give me an adjusted retention time for A. That was an equation that we talked about very early on in the semester and it still happens with on, on chromatography here just like it happened with any chromatography instrument. The WB would be the same way. I could take T sub B and taking T sub B and subtracting T sub 0 from it will give me the adjusted retention time. That is the retention time based on my instrument with my length of tubing that I'm using in my lab. So that is an adjusted retention time there. All right. A couple of other things. Width at half height. So we talked about measuring the width at the base. And that's perfect if your peaks are looking pretty good. The problem is that there can be funny things that happen to the baseline down here. So sometimes we'll do width at half height. And that could lead me to a better result as far as calculations and stuff that I need to know about. So width at half height, halfway up the peak, how wide is it? And then the same thing's going to happen here. Here's my width at the base for B. And then if I go halfway up that peak, there is my width of the peak at the half height height. So all of those terms are going to come back. They always have been around actually, uh, but I never really want you to forget them. So that's why I'm showing you that schematic here that you're seeing on your screen. Uh, here's another example of a chromatogram right here at the Y axis. You're seeing micro Siemens per centimeter. And down here at the bottom, you're seeing retention time based on units of minute. Uh, notice that the way that these elude off so we see fluoride, chloride, bromide, nitrate, phosphate, sulfate, and then iodide. Uh, there's a general trend that happens here, and this general trend is that your negatives will come off first, then your negative twos will come off, and then your negative threes will come off. It doesn't work that way every single time though, right? And you're seeing that instance happen here with sulfate and with phosphate. Phosphate's coming off at a negative three, and sulfate's coming off at a negative 2. So phosphate is eluding first before sulfate. So this is a general trend. It doesn't work every single time. But if I ask you that on a test, then that's what I want you to give me. Your negative 1's come off, then your negative 2's, then your negative 3's, right? Another thing where this doesn't quite match is here with iodide. So here at the very end, I see iodide peak. That's a negative 1. And you probably would think, well, that should come off before sulfate and phosphate. No, not necessarily, because that's only one half of the picture, 
okay? The other half of the picture are sizes. So, for instance, if you look at fluoride, chloride, bromide, nitrate, and iodide, they typically come off in the order of smallest to biggest. So, fluoride is at the top of the group, then chloride is on the next row down, then bromide is the next row down, and then iodide is the next row down after it. So that gives you an idea of working in the same family, and you see how those family ions will come off with each other. So smaller charges come off first, and smaller sizes come off first. Larger charges and larger ions come off last on ion chromatography. Another thing that I want you to look at is the time here. This is very uh, uncommon from gas chromatography. Uh, this is where ion chromatography and liquid chromatography become a little different. So what you're seeing is that the chromatogram here is going to be stopping at 20 minutes. So a lot of times in gas chromatography, our analysis times are a little bit shorter. But to measure one sample on ion chromatography, it can take 20, 30, 40 minutes at a time in order to get these values off of there. So you just got to be patient with it, and that's why auto samplers are going to be our friend. Another thing I want you to look at down here at the bottom, it says this sample that was ran had one part per million fluoride, two part per million chloride, four part per million bromide and nitrate, 32 part per million phosphate, a 4 ppm sulfate, and a 20 ppm iodide. They are all different, and the reason they chose those is because visually it makes you see the peaks a little bit better. Okay, so that's why they varied that up, and they had to vary it up because now you know that each one carries a different conductivity value per mole, and all of that was made in water. The eluent here was a millimolar sodium bicarb and a millimolar sodium carbonate, and that's pretty standard, pretty normal, and the flow rate here is one mil a minute, so that's typically pretty standard when it comes to IC flow rates as well. The injection volume is 20 microliters. Again, pretty standard. That's what we use on our instrument. We typically use a 1 mil a minute on our instrument. And we normally use a bicarb carbonate mobile phase with just a little bit of acetone to improve the peak shapes for us. Temperatures at 27 degrees, so they probably had an oven or something to control the temperature of everything that goes through just to make the peaks a little bit prettier and looking a little bit more like textbook pictures. All right, And it looks like the chromatography system here was a Shimatsu system with a controller, not a metrome, an auto injector, a pump, a degasser, a column oven, and we kind of assume that because it said 27 degrees, and a conductivity detector. And it gives me all of those pieces and parts all the way through. So keep in mind, I told you that HPLC or liquid chromatography is kind of the same as ion chromatography, right? There's both liquid, it's just one form, one specific form that we're talking about in, t in the field of ion chromatography here. All right, so that gives you a little bit of uh, chromatogram, peak shape, uh, and just, again, a little bit more review. Uh, something else that I want to talk about before this video stops uh, is this pretreatment stuff. A lot of times you'll look at pretreatment, and pretreatment is just cleaning up your sample before you run it on the machine. Uh, these are liquids most of the time, and we cannot have our liquids to gunk up the columns. So almost every single time, we're going to have to go through and we're going to have to filter our samples before we put them on the machine. We filter our samples. We normally don't filter the standards, okay? So the sample pretreatment, uh, you typically are going to have to put it through some type of filter paper, some type uh, of membrane filter, and normally this is 0.45 micron. Now they can go smaller. 0.2 is probably the next common size below the 0.45 that you typically would see in a lab, but 0.45 minimum. You don't want to go any number bigger than that. So 0.45 or smaller, those are the filter papers that you need to be using. And there's two materials uh, that, you would that you would commonly see with these types of filters. One is PTFE and the other one's PVDF. PTFE stands for polytetrafluoroethene and PVDF 
stands for polyvinylidene difluoride. Uh, there's really no difference between these two, and I'm going to say that, but then I'm getting ready to show you a diagram that probably does tell you there's a slight difference. Uh, but for what we use ion chromatography for and liquid chromatography for in the field of ion chromatography, uh, these two things uh, you will often see people use interchangeably all the time. Uh, but there are some specifics about them that you should know, and that's what we're getting ready to see on the next slide. Okay, uh, These filter papers are pretty convenient nowadays. Uh, what you're seeing here is uh, one of these filters, uh, and the NY is going to stand for nylon. And then the 0 0.20 micrometer, that is the pore size that it's going to filter. So anything bigger than 0.2 will not go through. It will stay behind, and only things smaller than 0.2 will go through and out the other end. So again, 0.45 is what we would traditionally see over and over, but 0.2 gives you a little bit of cleaner sample to run and analyze on the ion chromatography instrument. Uh, here's the diagram that I was uh, talking about before. Uh, there's other filter membranes, uh, materials that make up those membranes. Uh, here you're seeing PVDF, uh, cellulose acetate, PES, polypropylene, nylon, glass microfiber, PTFE, and regenerated cellulose. Uh, those are basically the choices that you have out there. Uh, and for instance, if I look at PES, it says filter of choice for ion chromatography. Uh, and it says it's ideal for aqueous samples, which we use most of the time in ion chromatography. It says very low protein binding and extractables. This thing is hydrophilic, which means water loving. And the pH range here, uh, that looks like it's going from 3 to 12. So you can't span the whole thing of 1 to 14, but that's normally what we would see every single time. So ion chromatography are PES membrane filters. Traditionally, those are a little bit better for the instrument. Uh, but, you know, if you've got a lot of people that have to filter and you have to stock the filters and you don't really want one filter to be designated to one instrument, then you probably need to something a little more universal. So if you look at the list and you kind of read down through, you see some good and some bad about everything. One of the ones that we talked about just now was PTFE, and it says it's good, right? All rounder with the best chemical resistance of any filter. And it can be used with strong acids, strong bases, and strong solvents. But it says it's not really suitable for use with 100% aqueous. So by far and large, the PTFE is a great filter to choose. But because we're using aqueous solutions and they're pretty much all aqueous, it's not the best choice. It might do the job for us but it looks like the PES might be a little bit better than the PTFE. The problem, though, is that if I order PES for the lab and I order PTFE for the lab and I say use PES for the IC instrument each and every time, well, people are going to mix it up and they're going to screw it up and they're not going to do what they're supposed to do. So we need something a little more universal so that way whatever box of filters you can find, you don't have to think about it. You can just go ahead and filter them. PVDF up here at the top, that's another one that we mentioned. It says an excellent all-rounder. It's good chemical resistance for acids, for bases, and for solvents. It's low protein bonding and low extractables. It says hydrophilic, and the pH range here is 0 to 14. So PVDF is probably a little bit better choice than PTFE. So if I had to get a universal filter that I could use on ion chromatography, then this version, PVDF, is probably a little bit better than the PTFE version. All right. So here are the two that I've listed. And these two are really probably the most universal out of the bunch. And these are what you will find most of the time in a laboratory. 
However, you will also have these other choices that you could pick from depending on what you're filtering and what type of samples that you're using. Okay. Uh, another one that I would like to talk about is the cellulose acetate. These are fully aqueous. They're ideal for protein analysis, but no organics in them at all. pH of 4 to 8. So they're very restrictive when it concerns the pH values here. So that's something that you want to stay away from. The cellulose acetate's not going to be a very good filter paper for our purpose. Here I've listed the PES. It's the great choice for IC. It's probably the one that we should be using over and over and over. Uh, but again, sometimes we'll buy the box that's universal for all of our instruments, not just for the IC. Uh, the polypropylene, excellent resistance, low protein binding, mildly hydrophobic though. So if we're working with 100% aqueous, that's really not going to cut it for us. Nylon, good all-rounder, but you can't use it with strong acids or bases. These are hydrophilic. My pH, though, is a little narrow, 3 to 14, uh, and some of the others can go a little bit lower than 3. Uh, here's the next slide. The glass microfiber was on that picture as well. These are excellent pre-filters. Uh, normally, the glass fiber will take out the big, large chunks, and then it will send it through another filter, and that filter will take out anything that's left behind. Uh, if you just send everything through, big chunks and all, you're going to have a tendency to stop up the filter, and it's not going to be able to be pushed through the filter paper. PTFE is down here at the bottom. Great all-rounder, has the best chemical resistance, but 100% aqueous it can't really handle. It is slightly hydrophobic, okay? Uh, some other sample pretreatment stuff that you might see, um, but these are notorious for contaminating the sample, is going to be your SPE cartridges. The SPE cartridges are a way that we can send a sample through. The cartridge will capture what we need to keep, and then it gets rid of everything else. And then we'll come back around and we'll hit it with another solvent, and that solvent will leach out the thing that it's captured in the prior run-through. Uh, these are great cleanup steps for your samples before they get analyzed. Uh, you might have to process samples using an SPE cartridge at one point in time, right? We've talked about these before, and I'm bringing them back over all over again. Uh, but these cartridges, if they are not cleaned out the proper way, they're going to contaminate your sample with all kinds of crud. That is a stationary phase on the inside uh, that's packing material on the inside, and these can house quite a few contaminants, especially ion contaminants that are there for you. So you just really want to make sure they're clean, that they're rinsed, that they're prepared the proper way before you go through and put your sample through them because they will be contaminated, and because of that, uh, you have a chance of maybe losing a client sample because of it. Uh, here are some troubleshooting techniques for ion chromatography systems. Again, ion is normally why we would use ion chromatography, and what you're seeing are some couple of things that we can do if we see a problem. So number one up here at the very top, high background conductivity, but a relatively low noise. Um, and it looks like the eluent has been contaminated with an anion. Something was in that bottle or something was on someone's hands uh, and that got contaminated in the DI water and the detector conductivity is spiking through the roof because of that. So you just want to check the conductivity of the water and if you think that it is pure DI water, then a lot of times to fix this, just dump the mobile phase out and make it new again and try it one more time. So if someone did contaminate it, which is the most common cause of the problem, then a good rinse of the bottle completely out and making sure that you wear gloves so that any kind of salty, sweaty residue that might be on your hands is not contaminating the, the mobile phases. Uh, high background conductivity in combination with high noise. So this is a sign that your suppressor is not working. It's also a sign of a back pressure in the detector. And it's also a sign that the membrane of the suppressor is worn out or is inhibited by metal ions or hydrophobic cations. A lot of times uh, what you're seeing here is it's suppressor related. So if you see high background conductivity 
and you have a noisy bass line, this is maybe a signal that your suppressor is running out. So you probably better need to have a backup so that way you can replace that suppressor and that it can do its job the proper way after that. Okay, uh, a couple of things that they tell you to do over here is just make sure that everything is flushed out. Make sure that none of your tubing's crimped. Uh, if you have to, go back through and replace some of the tubing and you'll be okay. Uh, next, high noise with normal background level. Uh, that probably means that you've got air in your system. Uh, so purge your pump and rinse everything out with alcohol. That typically will fix the problem a little bit better. And then you can go through and read the others on yourself. So just hit the pause button and then go through and just kind of read some of the other line items here and then figure out what is causing that problem. And over on the action side, it will tell you how to fix it. These are probably some of the questions that you're going to see on the test. So that way you don't go into it blinded, right? We've got everything about the baseline drifting to negative peaks to high back pressure so again, it tells you what the cause of it, and then it tells you how to fix it. All right. So that's where this video is going to stop. And I think that's enough information that you ever need to know about ion chromatography. So I think that this lecture module is now finished. And uh, the next lecture module that you'll see is still liquid, but we're going to be focused on high performance liquid chromatography known as the HPLC.